Think you know how the Salem Witch Trial started? You may be surprised on this week's episode of Footnoting History. Footnoting History listeners, it's Kristen. And today, we're talking the Salem Witch Trials. There's a lot of lore surrounding these trials, and many people have some familiarity with at least the broad outlines of what happened. But you may be surprised at how they unfolded. What we know, and of course, what we don't, but only wish that we did. If you'd like a captioned version of this episode, you can find it both on our YouTube channel and the Footnoting History webpage. The Salem Witch Trials of 1692 are the United States' claim to witch fame, I guess. It's not really a proud moment in American history, but it's a moment that we do love talking about. One of my favorite classes to teach has to do with the history of witch trials in Europe, and Salem, Massachusetts, which was a British colony in 1692, shows up at the tail end of the semester, because in 1692, the European witch trials were basically at an end. There are a few last gasps in the 18th century in Europe, but the mass trials and general hysteria have largely died down by the end of the 17th century. And then comes Salem. Oh, Salem. 1692 is generally the moment most of my students have been waiting for all semester. We've pretty much all seen Hocus Pocus, and maybe some of you brave souls have even visited Salem at Halloween. The parking is a disaster, but it's otherwise pretty fun. But most of my students are rather surprised by the Salem segment. A lot of people generally have this cursory familiarity with Salem and think they know what happened there. And then they find out it wasn't really what they thought. Salem has this outsized reputation in terms of witch trial history. And I certainly do not mean to say that it wasn't horrific. 19 people were hanged, one person was pressed to death, some people died in jail, and many, many more people were caught up in the movement. Marilyn Roach's book, The Salem Witch Trials, has an appendix at the end where she lists all the people who were accused, arrested, convicted, and sentenced. And it's a list of over 200 names. But when you're comparing Salem with the European witch trials, where hundreds, sometimes thousands of people were accused in an area, and there was just a steady stream of witch hunts and executions, sometimes for years upon years, Salem comes off as, well, not good, definitely not amongst the worst. Salem also isn't just Salem. First of all, Salem Village, the place where things first started, was a different place than Salem Town. It's close by, and today Salem Village is the town of Danvers, but it's even more than that. Mary Beth Norton, an historian who has written extensively on the witch trials, believes that they are better thought of as the Essex County witch trials, rather than just Salem, because the radius went pretty wide. In fact, they extended beyond Essex County, where the Salems technically were, into Stamford, Connecticut, which is in Fairfield County in western Connecticut. In Stamford in 1692, a servant named Catherine Branch leveled a lot of accusations of witchcraft, two of which were formally pursued in the courts and resulted in one woman being put to the water test in Fairfield Pond. Catherine claimed that a cat spoke to her and promised her fine things, which, as we all know, cats would never promise, so obviously preposterous. The women Catherine Branch accused were ultimately acquitted, but not before a lot of grief. Whatever happened in Salem really resonated with the people of New England in 1692. Okay, so, if people know anything going into Salem, they know that the witch trial started off because of some girls. Young girls who were playing games and ended up scaring themselves into thinking they were being attacked by witches. And by witches here I mean people the Puritans believed literally made a pact with the devil and then were actively using magic to harm them. The longer version of this Salem origin story is this. One winter night in Salem Village, Massachusetts, a few young girls were playing fortune-telling games. They were Abigail Williams and Betty Paris. Abigail was the orphan niece of Salem Village's preacher, Samuel Paris, and Betty was his daughter. 
According to the story, they wanted to know who they were going to marry and what their husband's jobs were going to be. And so they broke an egg into a glass of water and watched the shapes that the egg made and then read the glass, kind of like people do with tea leaves. According to the stories, they either got the idea from an enslaved woman living in the Paris household named Tichiba, or Tichiba actively encouraged them to use this scrying technique, or Tichiba did it for them. And one of the girls saw the shape of a coffin in the glass and freaked out. And that started the Salem witch hunt. It's honestly a pretty dramatic and entertaining way to start off. But there are a few problems with these stories. First, the existence of a few versions. A second, and more importantly, is the problem that this story, in any of its versions, does not appear in any of the contemporary evidence. It is important to recognize that Puritans, despite all their strong talk against it, did engage in sort of common, everyday magic, things like protective charms and, yeah, fortune-telling. We often take them at their propagandistic word a little too easily that they would never do such things, and if they had pearls, they would be clutching them at the thought. On paper, they do come down hard on these sorts of things, but the gulf between prescriptive literature and everyday actions can be kind of wide. There are two references to fortune-telling in a book by John Hale called The Modest Enquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, which was published in 1702. In the first instance, Hale wrote that in 1692, he knew, quote, one of the afflicted persons, and this afflicted person, he, quote, was credibly informed, did the egg thing to find out who her future husband would be. She saw the coffin and was, quote, diabolically afflicted for the rest of her life and died single. Hale doesn't say who this person was, though. There did end up being quite a few accusers beyond just Abigail and Betty. Abigail Williams did die pretty young, sometime before 1697, which would have made her about 17 years old at best. We don't hear about her getting married, so she likely did die single, but if she did, she wasn't on the market for very long, so it wouldn't have been that big of a shock to anyone. Anne Putnam Jr., another young accuser, who is not said to have been part of the original fortune-telling circle, also died single at a young age in 1699. Point being, Hale doesn't name the person, and he actually doesn't connect this incident to the Salem witch trials at all. He's got a whole long section on them later on in the book, and in this long section, he doesn't mention this. When he does talk about the afflicted person doing some fortune telling in this different section of the book, he follows it up with another story about another woman who did the same thing and who also had bad luck until he prayed with her and freed her from Satan. He doesn't date that story. Hale never says that his first story is what started Salem off in 1692, just that fortune-telling with eggs and glasses was kind of a thing to do in New England. And he didn't see it as related. No one at the time considered them related. And no one at the time thought it worth mentioning that the girls were involved in a fortune-telling game immediately before their afflictions began, including the girls. And so to that end, while it is very possible that the girls were doing a little fortune-telling. Historians more believe that this was a later insertion into the Salem story, one that would read as very plausible, but that doesn't have any evidence to directly support it. The other thing to really note about all this is that poor Tichiba, the enslaved woman who lived in the household with the first afflicted girls, had nothing directly to do with how the witch trial started. People generally assume that Tichiba had African ancestry because she was an enslaved person and because Reverend Paris purchased her in Barbados. When Tichiba was first questioned in late February, early March 1692, she did confess that she had made a witch cake and that, quote, her mistress in her own country was a witch, but she herself was not a witch. The witch cake is a reference to some magic cooked up by a local Salem village woman named Mary Sibley. Although Tichiba did the actual cooking on Mary Sibley's orders. It was a delightful concoction of the girl's urine mixed with rye meal and then baked in ashes and then fed to the family dog. Poor dog. Somehow, and it's actually a little unclear how, 
the cake would reveal the identity of the witch. When the poor dog ate the cake, the girls cried out that, quote, the Indian woman did pinch, prick, and grievously torment them. Mary Sibley, if you're wondering, did get in trouble for this, and Paris scolded her in front of the entire congregation about a month later, and she had to publicly apologize. But the person who really was affected by this was Tichuba, and relatedly the other women that she herself was pressured to later name. Exactly what Tichuba meant by her own country is also somewhat unclear. As many historians have pointed out, the sources describe Tichuba as, quote, Tichuba Indian, and her husband as, quote, John Indian, or some version thereof, and so they believe that Tichuba was Native American. In a history of the Bay Colony written in the 1760s, Thomas Hutchinson said that Tichuba was brought from New Spain, but this was almost 70 years after the fact, and New Spain could mean a lot of places. If the statement is correct... Tichuba was not from New England, if the statement is correct. One theory is that Tichuba came from a tribe in modern-day Florida and was kidnapped and then taken to the Caribbean. But mostly, people at the time were not that careful to document Tichuba's precise past in the source material, so there is a lot of ambiguity about her. However, because Tichuba very often got that Indian tag when she appears in the records, it does seem as if this aspect of her identity was a given for the people of Salem. 1692 was also a time when the New England colonies were facing a lot of attacks from Native American people, and Mary Beth Norton writes about this a lot. Threats from Native American people were very much on people's minds. Norton does not think it a coincidence that Mercy Lewis, who was a refugee from the main frontier where a lot of the Indian wars were happening, described accused witch Martha Corey as, quote, turning a spit with a man upon it, or that other witches were said to be tearing people to pieces or knocking them on the head, or witches were assembling at the call of a drumbeat. These are the same ways that many colonists and redeemed captives from these conflicts describe their interactions with Native Americans. Tichuba was important to the people of Salem only insofar as the witch trials were concerned. And once they were over, Tichuba, who did ultimately confess to witchcraft after being pressured and probably beaten by Reverend Paris, was left to linger in jail because she couldn't afford to pay the expenses she had racked up for keeping her imprisoned. That's how pre-modern jails worked. You had to pay for your room and board, and Tichuba couldn't, and Paris refused because that's just the kind of guy Reverend Samuel Paris was. After things settled, Paris actually sold Tichuba to pay her debt. And that's the last we hear from her. There's a lot tragic about Tichuba, but she did not make any fatal mistakes in trying to entertain the young girls of the household. As a person of color and a quintessential outsider to the Salem community, and as someone who was associated with a group that Puritans assumed were in league with the devil, Tichuba was the first person the girls pointed to as the root of their affliction when pressed to name someone. It makes a lot of stupid sense. And the girls? Well, yes, the first afflicted girls were pretty young. The first to display odd symptoms was Abigail Williams, who was 11 years old. And then it wasn't long before nine-year-old Betty started piling on. The initial accusers were pretty young, but there ended up being lots of accusers and people who offered testimony who were older teenagers or grown adults. And at first, Abigail and Betty didn't claim to be afflicted by witches. They're just described as experiencing, quote, odd postures, foolish talk, distempers, and just generically fits. People didn't automatically jump to supernatural explanations, which is one of the things that my students are often surprised by. The unseen world was a much realer thing to 17th century people than it is for us. But they did understand that there could be medical or natural explanations for events, and in this case, a local doctor was called in to try to figure out what was what. Except he couldn't. What is very interesting to historians of witchcraft history is that the girls' behavior closely mirrored that of stories of demonic possession that were sort of in the news at the time. Demonic possession was understood to be a thing that could very well happen, and Sometimes it could happen at the instigation of witches, but 
It didn't necessarily have to be because of witches. The devil could do that all on his own. Thank you very much. In 1662 in Hartford, Connecticut, a young woman named Anne Cole experienced, quote, extremely violent bodily motions, even to the hazard of her life in the apprehensions of those that saw them. These stories and others were popular, and they found their way into print. In the 1680s and the 1690s, the father-son clerical dynamic duo, Increase and Cotton Mather, published compilations of witchcraft cases, most of them from New England, and it had stuff like this in it. What happened in Essex County in 1692 sounds a lot like what the Mathers were writing about. It's not far-fetched to think that Reverend Paris was plugged into this discussion and that he was talking about it in his household. We do know that the adults around Abigail and Betty, particularly the men, had to believe that there was something to it all because grown men were the only ones who could bring formal accusations in court, and grown men were the ones presiding over the trials. It may have started with young girls, but there were plenty of adults who moved the ball forward. When Abigail Williams named George Burroughs, a former minister in Salem Village who had moved away to the main frontier, as the mastermind witch behind it all, she probably didn't come up with that all by herself. Burroughs had been gone for like 10 years at that point. There was no way that Abigail could have known him personally or remembered meeting him. If she heard his name, she heard it from someone else. Maybe it was Abigail Hobbs who had known George Burroughs in Falmouth, Maine. Or maybe it was Mercy Lewis, who had been a servant at one time. Or maybe it was someone else entirely. Burroughs didn't leave Salem on good terms, so there are many possibilities. We really don't know what the girls were suffering from initially, and we don't know if they consciously knew what they were doing. Historians do not think that they were suffering from a medical condition like epilepsy or ergot poisoning. Oh, that ergot poisoning theory that will not die. But no, it wasn't that. And that theory has long been disproven. But I know that there are probably a lot of people out there who are curious about it. So here we go. The ergot theory goes that Salem was an insular society and they had a bad harvest in the autumn of 1691. And so they had to turn to rye for making the bread when they ordinarily would not have done that. And this rye was infested with a fungus that contains a lot of alkaloids, ergot. These alkaloids can cause spasms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, a weak pulse, coldness and numbness and pain in the extremities, vertigo, burning sensations, and neurological signs of poisoning. Often people will talk about LSD-like symptoms and hallucinations, but that's not really what happens with ergot poisoning. People tend to see rainbows and halos, they have changes in depth perception, but they don't outright hallucinate. And even if you did have these neurological symptoms, they wouldn't be your only ones. The original symptoms of the girls are pretty ambiguous, but they do come to correspond with symptoms of demonic possessed behavior. The symptoms could also be turned on and off. The entire household was not experiencing symptoms either, and if they were all sharing the same food, they would have. The same goes for all of Salem Village. A lot of the Paris household's food came from farms all over Salem Village. It was part of his pay, so symptoms would not be confined to just his household. And while more accusers did appear, it wasn't everyone. Ergot tends to flourish when there is a cold preceding winter and then a cloudy wet spring and summer with a lot of fog and humidity. It does really great in marshlands. None of this describes Salem Village and it doesn't describe the weather right before the witch trials. People who often suffer from ergotism tend to suffer from a deficiency of vitamin A. Salem Village had a lot of dairy and fish, which are good sources of vitamin A. And many of the accusers came from well-off families who would have had access to these things. Once the trials end, so do the accusers' symptoms, so far as we know. Many did live full lives, and none are described as suffering from the residual effects that ergot poisoning is known to cause. Ergot epidemics have happened in history. In Manchester, England in 1927, there were about 200 people who were suffering from ergot poisoning. 
And they had the gangrenous signs and the headaches and the nervousness and the itching. In Ethiopia in 1978, 48 people died and about 100 others got sick. These aren't instances of, of mass hallucinations, though, and ergot's just not what happened in Salem. It is not unreasonable to think that bored and repressed young 17th century children acted out and things got out of hand. Ordinarily, young Puritan women are not heard from directly in the source material, which is why historians tend to seize upon the Salem girls, since we just don't often get anything like this. It's pretty exciting for us. Men tended not to take them too seriously. They didn't often have a formal, prominent, or public role in society. And so maybe this was an outlet for wanting these things, whether consciously or not. Or maybe that's just my 21st century perspective. The other thing to consider is that maybe some of the accusers were worried that they would find themselves accused if they walked back their claims, because this did happen. Mary Warren was one of the first accusers. She's usually famous for being the servant of John Proctor, who is a character in Arthur Miller's Crucible. And Mary Warren tried to walk it back. And when she did that, she landed up in jail as a witch. When that happened, things turned around again. And Mary, having confessed to witchcraft, then resumed accusing others of witchcraft and testifying against them. She did survive the trials, but the way things were going, that was far from a given at the time. It wasn't just that those who confessed to witchcraft were allowed to skate, and those who maintained their innocence were executed. Those who confessed to witchcraft were providing key testimony, and so their sentences were merely postponed. For example, a 50-year-old woman from the nearby town of Beverly named Dorcas Hoare confessed to witchcraft, was tried and sentenced to death. But her sentence was never carried out and she was eventually reprieved when the trials finally came to an end. Dorcas Hoare wasn't the only one like that. It is also extremely possible that the girls were just messing with people and they didn't care who got hurt in the process, which is a pretty cold explanation, but certainly within the realm of possibility. Early on, a man named Daniel Elliott testified that one of the girls boasted to him that, quote, she did it for sport. They must have some sport. We have no idea which girl this was, and nothing really came of it. But it is an interesting detail. Maybe one of the girls really was, very deliberately, making everything up because she thought it was fun. Maybe she later changed her mind. Maybe Daniel Elliott was making up this comment. We really don't know. Not a one of the accusers, after the fact, confessed to consciously making it up. Abigail Williams was the only accuser to take a tad amount of responsibility. She wrote out a confession which was read for her in church, and in it she says that she was very sorry for her role in things, but that she was deceived by the devil. Her uncle, Reverend Paris, says a similar thing, the old devil-made-me-do-it defense, which for the record, was a serious, real consideration for the late 17th century Puritan community of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. People were okay with this as an explanation. It's not that they didn't believe in witches anymore when things came to a close. They were just unsure of their ability to really find them. And so a final thought I'll leave you with is this. There were many people who made accusations of witchcraft in Essex County in 1692. There probably wasn't one reason, and we'll probably never know what all of them were. There were so many things that went into the mix to start the Salem Witch Trials. In addition to all of these things that we've talked about today, there were other factors that contributed to the tension in Salem Village in the later 17th century. There were religious tensions that had long been simmering in the village church. Not everyone was a full member, and not everyone was a supporter of Samuel Paris. And Samuel Paris. That guy. He was stirring up tensions for months ahead of the trials, with sermons that talked about the lurking, dangerous presence of the devil around them, but also within their community. There were also local grievances and people with bad, witchy reputations that had existed for years. Salem Village was an independent community that was still bound in many ways by Salem Town, which 
was seen as more urbane and less religious, and so there were tensions there too. King James II had revoked Massachusetts Charter in 1685. They got it back for one hot second in 1686, but it wasn't the same, and they lost it again, and it wasn't restored until 1691. The new charter didn't even get there until 1692 with the new governor, William Phipps, who stepped ashore to this whole mess. There were Quakers prowling around, preaching and pissing off the Puritans. There were Catholics too close for comfort in Canada. Oh, and witches were a real concern too. There was lots to be concerned about. All these things, and probably a million others that we'll never know, all contributed in some way to the perfect storm that made up the Essex County Witch Trials of 1692. This has been Footnoting History. Be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. We're on Instagram and Pinterest as Footnoting History. If you enjoy the podcast, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and consider supporting us through the shop link on our webpage or by becoming a Patreon supporter. A special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who help allow us to keep footnoting history open access and to continue bringing you exciting historical content. And until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.